Tonight, I will be sharing 10 stories, a few more than normal, but well worth your time. We will be going over stories involving a strange serum, a beast in the Canadian mountains, and much more. A huge thank you to the incredible authors who allow this video to be possible. Remember you can send in your own story to rylhstories at gmail.com. Likes and comments are always appreciated if you enjoy. Subscribing if you're new is as well. Enjoy the video, and as always, I hope you all have a great night. I'll be brief with you, as I only have a limited amount of time, 10 minutes at best. My name is Leo, and I am a man of hiking. I'd hike at any time of the day, especially at night. I've always loved nighttime walks in the moonlight. It may have been cold out, but there's an odd, relaxing part of being out in the quiet wilderness. However, this time it was different. Me and my friend Aldi have been hiking these same stretches of wilderness and mountains for several years now, but nothing could have prepared us for this. The trip started with the usual light banter me and my buddy have almost every night, talking about how our day went. I've never had many friends, and most of my relatives were never close to me. I'm a lot like my father in that sense, as we never liked being around crowds. Aldi and I had agreed to go on a late night hiking trip until 3 in the morning and then come back. It was pretty straightforward. We had our usual attire on, some very warm, skin-tight suits for cold environments, and normal clothes on top so we don't look weird in public. This may sound strange to some of you, but my little town is off the grid, and we have our own rules here. The suits are a precaution against hypothermia, as it prevents our body heat from leaving us, naturally. In a cold environment, this is okay, but not in the summer. It's easy to overheat and pass out in these things. Once we had all our gear together, which was snowshoes for grip, some pickaxes for climbing, in case it was needed, food, one gun each, flashlights, batteries, our phones and such. The guns were a standard issue around here, like the suits because of local wildlife. We have unusually large mountain lions in the region, although no one can figure out why. We left the house and proceeded to the hiking trails roughly a mile from the house. I was leading front with Aldi close behind, and the usual banter between best friends broke out. I'm curious, Aldi, why do you want to become a hiker? I asked him, to which he replied, Don't know. I just find being in nature relaxing, he said, as I nodded in understanding, feeling the same way. We don't typically talk too much on our hikes, so most of the trip was silent up until we reached a crossroad. What? There isn't a second trail here. I said puzzled. Leo, what's wrong, man? Aldi responded, not seeing the crossroad yet. I pointed ahead and his mouth dropped. When did a second trail appear here? The last time we were up here was just the other day, and we could swear there wasn't another trail. I asked Aldi if we should investigate, to which he worriedly nodded his head. So within two minutes, we were traveling the new trail, it was odd because we saw no footprints at first. After 10 minutes of walking, I stopped and looked back and froze as stiff as a statue. The entire landscape had shifted and no longer looked familiar. The hell? I murmured with a deep sense of dread. What is it this time, Leo? He said, still struggling to climb up the steep trails. It wasn't until he reached the top that he noticed it too. We had suddenly become lost. It looked as if we were somehow teleported somewhere else. Upon closer inspection, there wasn't a trail anymore, not in front nor behind. It was just forest and mountains. Me and Aldi were both freaked out, but then something made it worse. We noticed our guns and food were somehow gone, along with all our tools. I nearly screamed in utter panic. We were completely lost in the wilderness with no protection or food. All we had was our clothes. It was midnight by now at the least. The moon was as big and bright as ever, shining over the landscape. It was oddly beautiful. If only I could have enjoyed it longer. I turned around to consult Aldi on what we should probably do next, only to find him gone. My blood almost froze in my veins, and my heart stopped in my chest. A feeling of deep terror swept through me, like a wave as I realized I was all alone. And then, I noticed him. I saw a cave at the bottom of the hill we were on, but that wasn't the scary part. Aldi had been mutilated and torn apart, with an empty expression on his face. Despite being nearly 50 yards away, I felt him almost beg me to just run. I couldn't. 
I heard a growl no farther than 30 yards away, which prompted me to duck behind a tree. The growl was not natural. It sounded like something straight out of a horror film. And then I saw it. The beast is a mountain lion, but it isn't a normal one. It is at least 10 meters long and has eyes as black as night. Its body covered in blood and gore. It looked like a mountain lion, but it wasn't. It's massive, white teeth glistening in the moonlight. It's approaching me now. It's cold emotionless eyes staring at me as I was clearly its next meal. It moved so slow, it was agonizing. It's as if it wants me to let the word out. This is the end of the trail for me. To anyone who reads this, do not try to find me. You'll end up dead like me and my best friend. Tell the government, tell the police, tell anyone you can. Do not go into the mountains of Canada. It wants us to. I'd like to think of myself as a good person, not an unusually good person. I like to have faith in humanity, just not the kind of person who's a fan of those Redditisms like play stupid games, win stupid prizes, or lack of planning on your part isn't an emergency on mine. I try to help people, even when it's really not my responsibility and has nothing to do with me. But I really do like to think I'm not unusual. So for instance, I always try to carry things to give out to the homeless. Socks, emergency blankets, energy bars. It's not that other people don't care. It's that they don't have the luxury of the time and energy and money I have to be able to reflexively reach out to help. But sometimes I still question some of that faith. There's a woman on Rose Street who always does that to me. I don't pass her on my daily commute, but sometimes when I go to the bar with some pals after work, she's there. She sits just inside an alleyway, behind a broken gate, begging for scraps. She looks like she's an abuse victim, or she might be really sick. She's whiplash thin, and her face has faint bruises around her eyes. Her hair is this deep red color, and she's beautiful. And she's always just sitting there, injured and hungry. Nobody deserves that. And my friends or co-workers, or whoever I'm with, they act like they don't even see her. I'm fed up with it. Just walking past the homeless is a habit for some people, I know. But I've pointed her out, and they shrug and go directly into the bar. And I don't want to look weird, so usually I give her an apologetic look and follow them. But today I was alone. Bad day at work. And I just thought I needed a beer or several. I was heading into the bar when I saw her, remembering I had some spare socks in my bag. I thought I'd walk over. She smiled at me as I approached. Grateful I even noticed her, I thought. She'd set up shop in this alleyway, presumably for protection from the rain. But she hadn't even got some sheets of cardboard or any blankets or anything. It must be a good spot though, I've always thought. Because there's this chalk on the ground, colorful lines of red and yellow. I always thought it was a kid's game of hopscotch, or some other childish thing painted in the alleyway before she came along. Kids play in weird places, but anyway. The chalk doesn't seem to have washed away or even blown away by the wind at all, so I figured it must be a pretty sheltered spot. Hey, how's it going? Awfully cold out tonight. I greeted her. Yeah, it is. Awfully. But, you know, I'm used to it. She had a very slight accent, but I couldn't place it. Long vowels, and she rolled her R's like they tasted delicious, but her breathing sounded a little labored. I hesitated at the edge of the hopscotch. Something just felt... off. Are you feeling alright? She nodded. Just trying to raise a few dollars to get into a shelter tonight. I'm sorry. I don't carry cash. It's the truth. I find that I've got it. I spend it. Or give it all away to the first person in need of it. I pay for everything with an app on my phone, which reminds me of how much I have in my account. But I've got some socks you can have. New ones. Clean. I just carry them in case someone needs them. And I think I've got some chocolate in here if that helps. She nodded. I pulled the socks from my bag and realized it'd be rude to throw them to her. But there's just something that felt so wrong about stepping over that chalk line. Up close, it clearly was not a hopscotch. This thing has concentric rings full of beautiful patterns. Flowers in one ring, zigzags in another. What looks like some kind of runes or a script around the edge. She reached out an arm for the socks, but it didn't look like she could move easily. 
I suddenly felt so bad. There could be something wrong with her legs. She could be sick or just exhausted. And I'm hovering out of desire to not step on someone's chalk art. I put my foot into the circle and handed her the socks. Thank you, she said very sweetly. I was about to ask if she wanted the chocolate too, but then I noticed, as she reached for the socks, the folds of her scarlet dress had shifted and revealed something silvery and metallic, almost like a chain. She noticed me looking and immediately shifted her dress back over it, and I stepped hurriedly back out of the circle. That seemed to catch her attention. I looked down and noticed that as I stepped, I had very slightly scuffed one chalk line with the edge of my shoe. These are great looking socks, she said, but her eyes weren't on me. Every fiber in her body was brimming with this tension, this pent up energy, leaning towards the slight scuff mark I made with my shoe. She kept smiling so brightly and eagerly. Any chance I can have that chocolate you mentioned? There was a very fast, very closely fought war inside my head. My whole life, I've lived by this code. If you can help someone without hurting yourself more, you help. I try not to even hesitate because I want it to be instinctive. I don't want to have to use willpower. I want it to be my autopilot mode. But something felt so off. Just not right. Sorry, I have to go, I muttered. I didn't go into the bar. I went home, called the police, and told them there's a lady who might be paralyzed in an alleyway. I didn't mention that she might be chained up, because that's weird as hell. Who would take that seriously? They thanked me and told me they'd check to see if she's okay. The next time I went to the bar, it was closed. Something about the owners dealing with a personal emergency. I never saw the woman again. Me and my friends started going to a different bar after that. They said there was just a bad feeling about the place, even after it reopened. But seriously, even if there was something wrong, how was it okay for people to just act like she didn't even exist? I awoke to the sound of sizzling grease and the smell of fat burning. Fuck. I hadn't meant to fall asleep, as the litter of Red Bull cans on the coffee table attested. Nothing looked out of place, maybe this year. Without making a sound, other than the click of the hammer pulling back on my revolver, I slid off the couch and padded the three steps to the kitchen. Rounding the corner with a war cry, I leveled the gun at the intruder. Peter yipped in surprise and then pain as the bacon grease splattered. The tiny brass bells stitched to the red felt abomination on his head jingled madly with every shit, shit, shit. The hell, Diana? He asked, swatting at his forearms. I set the piece on the counter and shut off the stove. You can't just let yourself in like that. Why? You got some other bloke in here you don't want me to know about? He gestured expansively around the double-wide trailer. The unstoppable force of his grin, God, what a smile, collided with my immovable stoicism, then slid slowly off his face. What's wrong? The smell of charred meat was suddenly cloying. Was it growing stronger? I turned away to look out the window over the sink. You can't be here today. I brushed the curtain aside, panning across the bleak desert. Not but sand, salt, and scorpions. Why not, babe? I heard the bells loud as church bells as he approached me. It's Christmas. I wanted to wake you up with breakfast and couch. I could hear the good humor in his voice, smell the working roughness of him, and almost... Almost felt the comfort of his hand on my shoulder when a bump came from the roof. I whirled around, a trapped animal scream filling my throat. We need to leave now. But Peter was gone. I stumbled against the hard edge of the counter and slid to the ground. Tears filled my eyes and my vision doubled. Nothing remained save that damn hat. When I was a little girl, one night in April I wrote a letter and dropped it in the mailbox on the corner of our street in Santa Fe. I scrawled about my father's drunken rages my mother's disgust over her fading youth, and her envious of mine. The leering twats, always hanging around the building that my brother unironically called his posse. I had prayed in vain, gone to my teacher, only to be told I was lucky to have a family at all. And my friends, well, they had their own troubles without shouldering mine. So one invisible asked another to help, and maybe it was out of season. And that's why it went wrong, why I am forever bouncing from one town to another. Why it has been decades since a roaring fireplace was inviting, and not a source of revulsion. 
why I now must conclude that not even the salt flats of Utah are a potent enough ward to keep him away. But I was a child, just a baby. I know my exact wish was to just be left alone, and for the life of me, I can't remember to whom I addressed it. It must be a common enough mistake. Then again, disappearances, tragedies, and bizarre coincidences that border on the inexplicable are also common enough. I picked up the gun, loaded with paychecks worth of silver bullets, never tested because I have never seen him directly. In a daze, I wandered into the bedroom, in the closet, custom lined with lead. My two white rats, one male, one female, dug through their bedding frantically. Below them, the hermit crab tank appeared, at a glance to be fully occupied, as did the ant farm. The monarch butterfly chrysalisus remained as well, but seemed transparent in the work lights. When I touched one gently, it crumbled into dust. Empty. Is this usable data? I wondered. Peter's presence had irrevocably fucked up a year's worth of planning. When he arrives, if another human is present, they are always taken. The ladder of being in my closet was meant to define what, exactly, the entity considered loneliness, combined with the vast reach of the Bonneville salt flats outside my door. I had hoped to set a lower limit for what reward it would take in exchange, for what I guessed to be an enormous amount of pain, but a human, especially a pure soul like Peter. I felt tears threatening again as I stepped out in the harsh morning light. Peter's truck was parked outside. Many times, he had driven out into the nothingness, suspended on the thin thread of that truck's shit transmission to gaze up at the stars. It would have to be destroyed. I climbed the ladder to the roof. The previous night I had dumped and spread a hundred pounds of salt in a layer an inch thick. Gingerly, I crept around, looking for any imperfections. Sweat was running down my arms when I finally found it right over the spot where Peter had been standing, a small, circular depression with a four-inch wide disc of highly compressed salt at the bottom, relatively clear. I picked it up. In a flash of insight, I held it up to my eye and looked through it. I will never forget what I saw. But believe it or not, the images that mainlined into my brain did not definitively resolve my most burning question. Who had I addressed my childhood letter to? Santa or Satan? I honestly don't know where to begin. My time is limited and they could break through the barricaded door at any moment. I just have to hope I can get this out before anything further can happen. You're probably confused by what I mean. So I'll just cut to the chase. But be warned, what you're about to hear is disturbing. My name is Quan Wei. I am a 24 year old and I am Chinese, able to speak English fluidly. I may be in China, but I grew up in America for 20 years before moving out so I can speak my native tongue and Chinese as well. The reason I say I am from China is, if it wasn't obvious, I'm Chinese by blood. My parents left here long ago due to complications. Anyway, let's dispense with the pleasantries. Four years ago, I bought an old apartment on the bottom floor. It's roomy with a bedroom, a bathroom, a kitchen, and a spare bedroom for guests. The first few weeks of moving in was rather peaceful, and not a lot went on in this neighborhood, a rather quiet place to settle down, if you will. The hardest part of moving is getting all of your belongings together, packed into a shipping truck and moving, but for me, it was more difficult. I never had much money, but some influential friends of mine were nice enough to help me with the moving process. I won't go into detail about them. They prefer to remain secretive. They aren't malicious, just introverted and not a fan of being bombarded by others. Of course, my moving trip was far longer than a simple cross-country ride. For one, I had to fly, and all my things had to be shipped in a cargo plane that my friends rented out for me. It took around two months to finally get situated. Even after that, however, I still had to clean up the apartment, as it was old and looked as if it hadn't been used in years, at the very least. Luckily, my friends were independently wealthy, so not only did they help me with the moving process, they offered to fully refurnish the apartment for me. I asked for the typical stuff, repair the walls and add a fresh coat of paint, tear out the old carpets, and replace them with something more comfy to walk on, replace the old door with a metal one for better security. I even went as far as to add security bars on the windows, since it was a new neighborhood and I didn't know how my neighbors would act. I just don't have time for bull. 
if it wasn't already obvious. I'm rather paranoid about self-preservation. I can easily be thrown into a panic, kind of like I am now. As I write this, my hands are shaky. I digress. Anyway, the apartment was refurbished pretty quickly, and I was quite happy with the results. And afterwards, we moved all my things in, and my friend's men left. A neighbor was kind enough to make me some grilled chicken, Chinese style. It was a welcome to the neighborhood gift. We actually spoke for a bit, and she seemed really sweet, right up until I learned something that would change my life. For weeks on end, we spoke. The weeks turned to months. The months, a year or so. By this time, I was well situated in the region. I had learned every road in the town, made several new friends, and got a nice job at a very popular local Chinese restaurant. It paid pretty good as well. Way more than any food selling establishment in the US. I made enough money on my own to continue upkeep of the apartment, which was now a rather nice place. Other than one minor detail, or at least what I thought was a minor detail at the time. Last week, my neighborhood friend who I met one day asked me, have you ever seen a door in your basement? She said curiously, a glint of worry in her eyes. Um, no, I'm afraid I haven't, I responded, in truth. I didn't even know I had a basement. Well, be careful in there. The main reason I took interest in you was because several people have gone missing in that very apartment, and that's why it had been abandoned. Local legend suggests that it was built on an ancient gateway, presumably to something terrifying. Her words startled me, and also left me confused. I asked, Why wait till now to tell me this? I said nervously. She responded disappointingly. Because I didn't want to scare you away. You're a good guy and a nice friend. She replied back. At this point, I didn't understand what she was talking about, and I almost thought she was crazy. Four days later, I went down to the basement to get some supplies and food. When I noticed something about the basement, in the back, it was pitch black. It wasn't a normal kind of darkness either. It was almost creepy. It hung like a spider's web over the region and gave off an eerie vibe I never noticed before, probably because I never came back this far to get something. I placed the supplies down and went upstairs to grab a flashlight, my phone, and a 9mm pistol I bought in the States, with about 5 megs loaded with ammo. It sounds stupid I know, but I'm paranoid of the dark. More so than other people, and that's saying a lot. It took me almost 3 years to start making friends here. It would have taken even longer in the States, but I digress. Once I gathered everything, I went back down to the basement. With each step, I could feel my heart sink, like some alien force was pulling it down in my gut. It was an uneasy sensation, a feeling of deep dread. A dread I had never known before. I reached the bottom of the staircase and turned on the high power flashlight. My eyes widened in fear. The darkness in the back barely lit up, and it chilled me to the bone. It was now I realized there was a thick fog as black as tar back there. I couldn't even see through it, it was so black, words can't describe it. I sucked in a deep breath and spiraled myself forward, each additional step to the darkness feeling heavier than the last. I reached the back of the basement. By now, it was so pitch black I could barely see my own hand in front of my face, mere inches away. It was at this point I turned the flashlight on the highest possible setting, you know, that setting that is so bright it matches the intensity of a search spotlight. To my relief, it lit up the place. But the tiniest fraction of a second later, I noticed something on the floor. Blood. Dried blood. It was everywhere, and it looked as if it was leaking out of something. I followed the trail for god knows how long, until it ended at an old, rusted metal door. The door was ancient, perhaps over 10,000 years old, but that's not right. Metal would have corroded by now. No, whatever material that door was made out of, it wasn't earthly for sure. Upon closer inspection, the door was massive, easily 11 feet tall and 8 feet wide. I then noticed I was inside a cave. My stomach sank even farther, my heart pounding out of my chest, my breath rapping. I turned around and I didn't even see my own basement. Instead, I saw a long tunnel, rigged with a normal cave stretching as far as the eye could see. But that was impossible. I'd only walked for what felt like 40 feet. The evidence before me said otherwise. It was as if I was meant to find this old, rusted door. I noticed something else. The environment was no longer pitch black. It was accompanied by a dark shade of red, presumably from the massive amounts of blood on the floor. I dared not look at the walls or a ceiling for fear of something I'd regret. Curiosity got the better of me. As I looked at the walls, 
I saw veins, pumping, pulsating veins. It looked as if I was inside a massive creature, but the wall still looked like that of several blood vessels attached to an alien looking black muscle. The walls began to move. I didn't know if I was hallucinating due to panic, or if my eyes were being honest with my mind. I felt like I would pass out, not just from what I had witnessed up until this point, but also the fact that it was dead silent down here, not the slightest sound, other than my own breathing. I never felt so isolated in my entire life. Nevertheless, I turned back to the door. I was too far to turn back now. Famous last words, now that I think about it. I approached the door ever so cautiously. The gun was hoisted around my waist in its holster still, which did make me feel somewhat more comfortable. I reached out for the large handle on the door, grabbed it, and pulled. Nothing. The door didn't move. I put more weight into it, but the door refused to budge an inch. That's when I noticed something I didn't see before. A sign had appeared next to the door seemingly by magic. It read, Abandon all hope. Ye who enter here. I gulped in fear and looked farther down the sign, and it said more. Blood. Blood? I wondered. Why would a sign say blood and nothing else? And that's when I remembered something. My friend said this was a gateway to something far worse than hell, and I saw blood everywhere on the way here. Perhaps blood is the key to open it. I noticed a silver platter just below the old wooden sign. I sat on top a large, hard block of some unknown material with pumping veins on it. I knew then what I had to do. I bit my bottom lip, took a deep breath, and bit my own arm hard enough to draw blood, muffling a scream of agony. I then reached out while trembling in agony, letting my arm drip blood down onto the platter. For a few moments, nothing. Then, in the tiniest fraction of a second, the room began to shake really violently. A loud, guttural roar echoed through the cave system, and the walls went from rock and veins to pulsating organs, muscle, bone, and other substances I can't even fathom. My body trembled in a type of shock and fear I had never known before in my whole life. A fear unrivaled by anything. It was a level of fear that even one's most terrifying nightmares couldn't induce. I heard the sound of a heartbeat. As I looked back to the door, it had turned into a face, but not one of recognizable features. It was beyond demonic. A creature, far more evil, and far more horrific than hell indeed. At this point, I no longer had control over my body, and I had started to panic. I felt as if something was forcing me to do things I didn't want to do. I couldn't help but scream as the door flung open with a loud thud, revealing an endless blackness before pulling me at terrifying speed into the door and slamming hard shut behind me. I wasn't falling, but I was being dragged somewhere by a force I couldn't even see. I was in a blind panic, clawing at the ground, trying to stop myself, but the force was too great. My nails were ripped clean off as I cried in pain still being dragged at such a vast speed. I was easily going 100 miles per hour at this point, but where? And that's when the presence let go. It took me what felt like an eternity to finally get up, my body in pain on a level I didn't know I could handle. I looked around and noticed I had lost my flashlight. I must have dropped it when I was forcibly dragged into the abyss, but I noticed I didn't need a flashlight now. The darkness had lifted, and I saw something that has me sweating still, even now. All around me I saw endless desolation made of organs, bones, hearts, and other body parts of things not even of our own world. Nothing was recognizable. The place had no ceiling and no horizon in any direction. But what it did have? I saw things no one should have to witness. There were people being mutilated, torn apart, things I can't even mention here because it's so gruesome and morbid and wrong. Their twisted, contorted faces and bodies, writhing in pain and terror begging me for my help. Some were skinned, and had nothing but muscle and bone showing. They all screamed at the top of their lungs, begging for mercy. It was the types of screams you'd only hear in a state of pure, primordial horror. There was also fire, but not like any fire I'd ever seen before. The hue of the flames wasn't that of color, but a frequency that mortals' minds cannot comprehend. I felt compelled to move forward. With each additional step, it felt like I stepped a mile, and the further I went, the scarier and more morbid things got. My eyes were opened wide now and bloodshot red, straining to see something that wasn't complete devastation. Instead, they were met with a grim reality. My reality. I was trapped with no way out. 
I looked at the creatures. Some were no larger than maggots, others as big as mountains. It all looked like something straight out of an H.B. Lovecraft story, but it was all too real. The creatures were a whole new level of terrifying. Dwarfing the door I described earlier, I felt a new kind of terror. One that broke my spirit and shattered my soul. I lost all sense of hope or sanity. I scrambled with primordial instinct driving me. I ran with a strength I never knew I had before, back in the direction of the door. My brain felt like it was going to break if I stayed in here for even a second longer. I heard several creatures roaring with an intensity I never felt before. Like hot, solar wind smashing into me from behind. I felt like the very skin was being burned off my body. As I scrambled up the steep hill, I was dragged down. Somehow, through sheer primordial will, I reached the top and found the door. After what felt like an eternity of running, with all my might, I pulled the door open and slammed it shut behind me, hearing the creatures smash against it with terrifying force behind me. They shrieked in rage, demanding me to return to my fate. I needed to do something to stop them from getting out. I managed to find my flashlight, and driven by panic and fear, I grabbed boulders that were scattered around the entrance and piled them up with such brute strength I never knew I had. It must have been the adrenaline pumping like a madman through me. I piled what looked like several hundreds of boulders around and on the door, and then bolted back through the cave. It felt like weeks before I reached the familiar site of my basement. I stopped for a moment to catch my breath, but only for a moment. I ran up the stairs and slammed the door shut, piling every piece of furniture I could around the basement entrance. And now, we reach where I am now, sitting at the only piece of furniture left in my house, not piled up against the wretched basement door. I don't have much time left. I can hear them approaching the basement door, taunting me in the darkness below. I know I can't run from them. It will only be a matter of time before my fate is certain. To whoever reads this, I pray that you never have to see what I saw, or go through it. Please, stay safe. And if you ever see a door in your basement, run. When I was little, my stepdad, Nate, used to work the night shift at a gas station on the outskirts of Reno, Nevada, in a nice part of town right off the highway before you head up to the Sierra Nevadas in Lake Tahoe. I think it was Highway 80, though it's been so long I'm not entirely sure, but what I do remember was that it was still the same route you could have taken to each Donner Pass, which is the party, along with the Reeds, who were settlers that got snowed in on their travels to California and wound up eating their dead companions to try and stay alive. The area back then was fairly new, and the newer Shell gas station was honestly one of the nicest gas stations I knew of at the time. There was quite a few other stores in that area, along with a bagel shop and a grocery store. Smith's, I think. And everything was built off this really dark wood paneling, and I believe stone. Beyond the shopping center, and off on a side road from the highway, were some new apartments that I think were gated. And on the other side of the highway, and across the shopping center, there used to be an empty field. Though the last time I was out there, I think it was developed to buildings of some kind. Nate never had any serious problems working the night shift, though he did tell me some interesting characters would come in and make the long shifts more bearable, and he often had regulars that he became friends with. He was the only worker in the gas station when he worked the night shift, and he was always told by co-workers about the ghosts that liked to pester the workers. Like turn off lights, open or close the bathroom door, knock snacks off the shelf, you know. The works. Now Nate, being the massive skeptic as he is, didn't believe any of these stories. And because nothing ever happened to him, he just brushed them off. Until one night. Nate is working on the night shift as normal, and it's a pretty quiet night. He hasn't had many customers come through other than for gas. Hardly anyone came into the store. So he's playing on his iPod Touch and frequently glances at the doors or at the security monitor to see if anyone is coming, but the station is deserted. He turns his attention back to his game when he hears the electronic sliding doors open and the sound of the bell above the door goes off. Nate puts his iPod down and looks up to greet the customer, but he doesn't see anyone. He calls out, but no one answers. He glances at the security camera, but doesn't see anyone else in the shop except him, and there are no cars at the station or in the parking lot. He gets a little weirded out, since the doors have sensors, and the only time they open is if they sense someone approaching them, but he just chalks it up to a prank, or some sort of malfunction, and gets back to his game. Hello? He hears the voice as clear as day right in front of him, and his head immediately snaps up to speak to the customer he clearly did not see before. 
but there's no one there. He's even more weirded out by this point, but convinces himself he was either imagining things or that the sound somehow came from his iPod or the radio. And then he hears the screams. He said the sound of a woman screaming came out of nowhere, and they were so loud and so chilling he jumped and dropped his phone. My stepdad is a pretty big guy, about six foot two and a little hefty, and he doesn't normally get scared over anything. But he said the screaming scared him so much he couldn't even think. He ran out from behind the counter and checked the aisles, but no one was in there. He checked the bathrooms and maintenance closet, and no one was in there. But the screams were still going, and they were still deafeningly loud. So he thinks maybe there's a woman outside who might be hurt or being attacked. He ran outside to where he thinks the screaming woman is, and there's no one. The lot is empty. There are no people, no cars, nothing. He checks around the back of the store and does a loop, but he can't find the source of the screaming and, just as suddenly as the screaming had started, it stopped. He goes back inside and checks the security tapes to see if he's missing anything. But other than him running inside and outside of the gas station like an idiot, he didn't see anything else, and he's unsure of what to think. The next day, as he's leaving work and his co-worker takes over, he tells them about what happened, passing it off as just some weird prank some little shit pulled. But the co-worker's response was very different. And even though Nate doesn't believe in any sort of paranormal activity, the word still stuck with him for all these years. Oh, so you've heard her too? For context, I live in the Midwest, in a suburban area. My boyfriend also lives in a suburban area, about 30 to 60 minutes away from me, depending on if I use either the interstate, highway, or city roads. That being said, I usually take the interstate there, then take the highway part way home. Since the highway is only about a mile or so away from his neighborhood, and I take it all the way to the interstate. There is also another road I can take, a paved country road with one lane on each side of the road, with no streetlights. It eventually meets up with a few main streets, which are numbered roads we use where I live, and it will take you back towards the highway and city. I'm sorry for all the background about the roads, but I feel that it's important, and I feel like my choice was a definite sign that the butterfly effect is always in works. On to the story. Earlier today, I went to pick up my boyfriend as we basically hung out and binge watched a TV show I recently got him in, Broadchurch, around 11 p.m. He says he should probably go home since he works that morning. I agree and drive him home using the interstate with no problems. We kiss goodbye, and then I am on my way out of the neighborhood and towards the street that takes me to the main roads. If I turn right, it's a straight shot to the highway. If I turn left, I can take it down the country road for a bit of a late night drive. I decided to take the latter. I turn left, then turn right at the stoplight, and begin to drive through the dark country night. It was nice out, so I had my windows rolled down and my music up, just letting the breeze come in. It was pretty windy, so my car was swerving a little from the wind, and you couldn't see the stars or anything because the clouds were taking over the sky, building up a storm. I thought about switching on my high beams to see better, but the road was really curvy and had a lot of hills and I was afraid I'd accidentally blind someone coming from the opposite direction. What happened next made me glad I didn't turn them on. On the left was a small patch of woods and overgrowth. To my right were wide open, empty fields, and in front of me was a hill. Toward the crest of a hill, I saw something beginning to cross the road. Something large and dark, with what looked like antlers on its head. I thought maybe at first it was a deer or even an elk, and I slowed down, but when I got closer, I realized something was wrong. One of the things that were wrong was that it was moving very slowly, like it was hurt or something, and it didn't even glance at me. It just kept moving towards the patch of trees to my left, which I thought seemed weird. I felt like it should have at least acknowledged the sound of my vehicle. The second thing was that this thing, this animal that I presumed was a deer or elk, couldn't have been. It was at least the size of a moose, but that couldn't be right. Because where I'm from, there are no moose. We had deer and maybe some elk, but not moose. I felt a cold wave of dread wash over me as I watched this moose thing make its way across the road. And then it stopped, and it looked right at me. It twisted its head so fast to look at me, I almost screamed. Its face was hideous. It looked rotten somehow, like it was withering away. And its eyes were so dark. I was so scared it didn't have any eyes. There was blood dripping from where its mouth was, and I could see sharp teeth poking out from its lips 
as they pulled back into a sneer. I thought about reversing my car and hightailing it out of there, but I was frozen. You know when adrenaline kicks? They say you enter either fight or flight mode. Well, they don't tell you that there's a third option, and that's to freeze, which is exactly what I did. I just stayed in place, hands still on the wheel, foot still digging into the brakes. I don't know how long I sat there, staring at that thing with a thing staring back at me. But when it started towards the car, I honestly thought I was going to die. I couldn't move, couldn't blink, couldn't barely even breathe. All I could do was hope and pray that I wouldn't be killed by some freakish, moose-looking monster. And then a pair of lights began to rise over the hill towards us. And as the other vehicle's high beams shone on the thing in the road, it let out this blood-curdling scream that didn't sound entirely human. It was guttural and animalistic and sort of raspy. It's hard to explain. But I watched as that thing got on its hind legs and lurched itself across the road and into the thicket of trees and bushes, narrowly missing the other person. I knew that thing would probably come back if I stayed where I was. So before I could give it a chance, I slammed on my gas pedal and gunned it out of there, going well over the posted speed limit. I just wanted to get as far away from it as possible. Every dark curve or patch of trees or field made me so paranoid that I would see the creature again. And all I wanted to do was go home and never for the life of me drive on that godforsaken country road again. I made it home safe, but shaken. And to cut a long story short, my family thought I was being hysterical and had just seen a deer. But I know what I saw. And that thing wasn't a deer. It couldn't have been. I've lived in this house for 13 years. Nothing ever happened out of the ordinary except for something I encountered one summer day. Flashback probably six to seven years ago. I was riding my bike down the gravel road beside the metal recycling plant I live next to. And at the time I had an all black purebred German shepherd named Shadow. She was great. Anyway, there's a slight curve in the road and when I went around it, I seen something that still haunts me to this day. There was a strange big black animal standing in the middle of the road staring directly at me with its yellow beady eyes. This animal was absolutely giant. With its head all the way up, I'd wager it was at least seven feet tall. Now because I had Shadow, I naturally assumed that this big dog shaped animal was Shadow. So I called her and instead she stepped up beside me without even noticing that there was anything in front of her. A fox walked up beside this dog and looked up at it. The fox looked like a puppy next to it, even though it was fully grown. As soon as I realized what was happening, I quickly turned around and rode my bike back to my house. I was pedaling as fast as I possibly could. I could feel his presence behind me as I pulled into the driveway. Once I got to the deck, I turned around. There was nothing but a light black smoke from the end of my driveway. Now, on to what happened recently. It was probably 9-10 to 10 months ago. I was laying in my bed and I needed to go outside for a smoke. I got outside and lit up my cigarette, sat down on the deck and thought nothing. In the middle of taking my drag, I heard a very loud scream. It was pitch black outside. The scream seemed far away yet ear-piercing. It was absolutely blood-curdling. It sounded like a 25 to 30 year old girl was brutally cut down in her home. I froze. The cigarette fell from my mouth as an ominous sound started coming from the bush. It sounded like a beast cutting down trees as it was cutting its own path through the dense forest of northern Alberta. I looked onto where the creepy sound was coming from. I could hear the beast grunting and panting as it whipped through the bush. I looked on. After hearing this sound for more than a few seconds, the beast burst through the trees and starts tearing ass across my yard. It's about a hundred yards. This animal sprints across my yard without taking its yellow eyes off me for a second. It cleared my whole yard in under two seconds. It seemed as if it was jogging, very gentle movements without any visible strain. It looked back towards the trees as it was probably five feet away from the bush. As soon as it entered the abyss, I heard more grunts and pants, seemingly getting closer and the second it felt as if it could snatch me up, it stopped. Not a single sound, not a smell, gone without a trace. The only thing I could hear was my burning cigarette on the ground. As soon as I realized what had happened, I ran inside, locked all the doors, shut off all the lights, sat in my room and waited. Nothing happened. I was 16 at the time. Even more recently, one of my friends, we'll call him Roy. Roy had just got a pair of walkie talkies and we wanted to try them out, so he went all the way across my yard and I went to the other side. We could talk very clearly to each other and it was pretty cool, until he said something that made me snap. 
We were chatting from across the yard and having a good time. Then he mentioned that he just heard a scream, and it was super loud, and sounded uncomfortably painful. I instantly told him we had to get out of there. He said why. I told him we could talk once inside. I started running, knowing what was about to come flying out of those trees. He started running and once we got to the deck, we stared out into the yard. It was evening so the sun was just starting to set. We stared until we heard the sounds, that same grunting and panting I had heard before, just with more branch and tree snapping sounds. We ran inside and looked out the window. Nothing. It was never seen since. I lay here writing this and worry that whatever it is could come and snatch me up. It's just biding its time, waiting for the perfect moment. I just got back from a friend's house for her birthday with a few other girls. I've been waiting to post this since this morning. For the sake of privacy, we're going to call her Sarah. All other names were changed as well. Sarah and I have been friends for around a year now, and her birthday was Tuesday, so she invited me, one of our other friends, Kylie, and some other girls from her school, Sadie, Brayden, Brooke, and Tiana, as well as another girl who didn't stay long, Samantha. The beginning of the night started out well enough. We walked around the neighborhood for a bit going down our driveway and down the street to the left since going right would lead us to a busy main road. Nothing really happened at first. The only thing kind of off about this time was while we were going down the street, a silver car pulled out of a driveway we were walking past. After it pulled out, it went maybe 10 yards at the most. They stopped and backed up closer to us. They rolled the windows down and the guy driving looked anywhere from maybe 17 to 20. There was another guy in the passenger seat who looked about the same age as well, as a girl in the back, who looked a bit younger. The guy who was driving looked all of us over before asking how old we were. We were reluctant to answer, and I grabbed Kylie and Samantha's sleeve, ready to sprint if anything happened. Sarah was a little ways down the road, and her being the oldest, while still looking younger, Samantha decided to try and play it safe. By saying that the oldest out of us was only 15, the guy driving looked us over again and apparently decided that it was not worth charges and drove away. Soon after, we headed home. The rest of the night went smoothly. We just played Cards Against Humanity and talked for a while. Until Sarah's parents went to bed, everything was normal. We kept playing for about an hour and a half after they went to bed. But soon, we got pretty restless. Sarah had the bright idea to suggest sneaking out, and we were all for it. We got so excited to finally fulfill our rebellious teenage dreams of sneaking out after dark. We were trying to be as safe as possible about it, making sure we all stuck together. If a car comes, dive in the ditch, kind of thing. We decided we would start a small fire in the fire pit outside, so we would have an excuse if they woke up. So we all went outside and tried to start a fire to no avail. Lighter fluid and all. It wouldn't start, and we were fairly certain that Sarah's parents were asleep enough to not hear us, so we left a bit early. Being in Louisiana, we wanted some form of protection, so we grabbed a machete just in case. We walked down the same street we had walked down earlier. It was going well, and everything was okay, so we kept going for maybe two or three more minutes. I stopped dead in my tracks when I heard a rock grinch in the paved road behind us. I spun around with my flashlight on my phone as fast as possible, and I swear to God, the same guy was driving the car earlier in the day, was standing right behind us, following us. The second he saw that we saw, he turned and walked slowly to the side of the road and into the woods by the road. As stupid as this sounds, we just wanted to brush it off and keep going, so we did. Maybe 30 seconds after, we started walking again. The girl who was in the back of the car walked out of the woods by the road and was in front of us, clearly visible due to the streetlight over Hen. Like the other guy, once she saw that we saw, she went back into the woods. I don't think I really have to say that we turned around and walked as quickly as we could back to the house. The walk back up the driveway was fine and uninterrupted until we were close enough to the front porch the guy who was in the passenger seat was standing in the front door, smiling so big I honestly thought my mind was making it up. It looked so unnatural. It was a paved driveway, and the light didn't reach us so he couldn't have seen or heard us, due to the fact that we hadn't said a word since we decided to go back. Very much so terrified, none of the girls moved, so I took the lead tiptoeing on the pavement to the back door. We thought that the back door would be fine, but as you can probably guess, we were very incorrect. The guy and girl we saw on the road were standing at the back door. We couldn't get in. Machete and all, we were not about to do any of that, so we waited. We snuck back behind our mom's car and waited for them to leave. As if by miracle, a dog that we had played with earlier in the day came running out of the woods past us. 
and towards the driveway. This caught the driver's attention and he and the girl began walking slowly, almost creeping toward the driveway, waiting for the other guy to follow. He did, and we took our chance the second it came. Once they got far enough away, we tore out for the back door. We made it inside and locked everything we could think to lock and tiptoed back to Sarah's room. We turned out the lights and sat on the floor in silence and shock. Long after, maybe two hours, we wanted to go to sleep and put everything that had happened behind us, and we would have, if the smoke detector didn't go off. Confusion, then panic. It only beeped three times, but it was enough to recognize the sound. We went to the kitchen and living room first. We could smell smoke. Someone, though I can't remember who, opened the back door. The fire in the pit was lit. Her parents slipped through the smoke detector, followed by us stampeding through the kitchen. After marveling at that, we all went outside to check the fire. It was lit and very much burning. I decided that someone had to have lit it. We didn't want to just leave it burning, and if we put it out with water, it would create way too much smoke and most likely set off the smoke detectors again. So we all sat outside by the fire, talking about what all happened. Soon the fire began smoldering, and we eventually put it out and went back inside ready to go to sleep, as it was around 4am. We went to sleep, and I had a weirdly nice dream until I woke up to the horrific feeling that someone was watching me. As cliche as it sounds, I knew there had to be someone in the room. The only thing I could think of was remembering that we didn't lock the back door when we came in. I didn't dare open my eyes, and all I could feel was panic, until I didn't. I suddenly felt fine and at peace. I woke up at 9, the same time as everyone else. I don't know what to make of last night. We still haven't told anyone. Not her parents, not our parents, or friends, or anyone. I really just hope it goes away, and I can promise you, I don't plan on ever sneaking out again. My friend and I went to McDonald's a little late at night, around 11pm for some McFlurries. We seen this crazy looking guy inside when we got there talking to himself. He had a coffee in his hand and kept walking in and out repeatedly, while saying, is this a train station? He had two duffel bags with him. I should add in that my friend and I are both guys. Working at the time was two female workers. They came up to us and asked if we could stay inside with them once we finish our McFlurries. They even offered us a few meals to stick around. We agreed without hesitation. They said the guy was creeping them out. And it must have been the tenth time this man walked outside, we took the opportunity to lock both doors, not realizing at the time that his duffel bags were still inside. Someone behind the counter called the police. Turns out, the bags had machine guns, handguns, duct tape, and handcuffs in them. This guy was wanted by law enforcement in three different cities. He had broken out of a mental hospital after writing in his journal that he wanted to kill someone. Crazy night to say the least. Oh, and we also both ended up getting jobs at that McDonald's. <laughs>